everyone. Salam, namaste, adab, and welcome to today's event. Today we are going to hear on a very different topic, gender, education, and marginality, realities of Muslim girls' education in India. And the speaker is Professor Satvinder Pal Kaur, who has done a lot of work on in this subject. She is a professor and chairperson, Department of Education, University of uh, Punjab University at Chandigarh. And she told me to introduce her only as a teacher. So I'm not going to say much, except that she seems to be a very good teacher, a very good researcher. Her discipline and interests are educational policies, equity, exclusion, educational issues of marginalized and minority groups. She will be formally introduced uh, by Dr. Namlis Sharma, who is the assistant professor at the Department of Education, Central University at Himachal Pradesh. He is a very good researcher, author, and a well-known columnist whose, whose columns have appeared or articles have appeared in all the national dailies and magazines. And the concluding remarks will be given by Mahima K. Gupta, who is a master's from Syracuse University here uh, in United States. And she has done a triple major in political science, international business and marketing. And her interest is on the, uh, basically in Punjab one district, what is called Malar Kotla, which is a Muslim uh, majority area, I guess. And she has the educational experience of Muslim minority girls in Malar Kotla. So welcome you all. And now it is turn of Dr. Navdi Sharma for the introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, well from India and uh, to respective timelines. Uh, good afternoon or good morning as, as the schedule goes. So it's always an honor to share platform with Professor Satinda Pal Kaur Ma'am. She is a prolific researcher, writer, columnist, and she is one of the few sane voices who are left in India working rigorously on academic issues. So at the very outset, I thank uh, Raziuddin Sahab for selecting such a topic. And also, uh, I, I uh, wish to emphasize on the courage of what Professor Satvinder Pal Kaur Ma'am is doing these days, because we all know the way whole things are getting polarized. And people are trying to say that there are no entities like Muslims and Muslim girls. And in these times, and in these trying times, there are prolific researchers like Professor Satvinder Palkar, who bring a silver lining to the understanding of academics that yes, there are people who rigorously want to work upon these ideas. So Professor Satvinder Palkar is at present uh, professor and chair at the Department of Education, Punjab University, Chandigarh. She has more than two decades of experience as a teacher, in fact, around 25 years. And when, when you talk about certain issues in educational discourse, if you wish to talk about urban poor, if you want to talk about Muslim girls, if you want to talk about tribal communities, if you want to talk about col colonialism, you need to go and refer to the work undertaken by Professor Satvinder Pal Kaur. And that's how her work speaks for her and one of her recent endeavor where she translated one of the book by another classic academician, Professor Krishna Kumar of his one of the book, uh, What is Worth Teaching? She translated it into Padhan Jo Ki Hai. And that's how she has brought also closer that idea of that what kind of sociological discourse, what is the idea of pedagogy, what is the idea of curriculum that she wish she wishes that her students engage into and the people engage into. Now quickly, I'll just, uh, uh, just flag about certain concerns which I would wish that Professor Satinda will shed more light in her talk. And uh, what I, uh, when I heard this topic about gender education and marginality, uh, I was uh, wondering that uh, we all have presumed this idea that improving women education is the most significant way of bringing any kind of change into the understanding of education into the world and the idea of a better world. So what exactly we mean by marginalization? That's one of the understanding that I look forward to 
from the stock. Is that about uh, relegating few people to fringes or to periphery? Or is it about social exclusion? Or there are few synonyms about marginalization, which are like uh, oppressed, subaltern, and powerless. Obviously, oppressed was used by Freire and Gramsci said subaltern and Foucault said powerless. So how we see this marginality, how this marginality works in case of Muslim girls and the area which uh, Raziuddin Saab was suggesting that Professor Satvinda has worked on Maler Kotla and she has also worked on the Mujaffar Nagar. So how these different regionalities, how, how uh, beside the religion, how beside the traditional sex roles, these regionalities also play a role, how these cultural differences also play a role. That's what uh, we would love to hear from Professor Satvinda. And of course, one of the many scholars that I could see on the screen, we could also think about a little discussion about uh, Tarbiyat, Tadib, and Talim, uh, and how how Muslim women and Muslim girl child is taken into that discourse, and why why it was always believed that women are more vulnerable, impressionable, and can't discern between right and wrong. So uh, there has to be more more efforts about educating a Muslim girl child, and uh, the efforts about get, uh, getting Muslim uh, girl child educated goes long back to 1906 when Sheikh Abdullah opened the first school along with Wahid Jahan Begum in Aligarh. And then of course we had Paldana Shi Madalsa and then much of the water has flown down then that time. So there are many questions that which we look forward to. I'll just invite Professor Satvinder call with the data just only to ask her to deliberate upon this idea that when we look in comparison, there are only 52% uh, women girls, uh, women Muslim girl child who are who are in the schools in comparison to other communities. So what happens there exactly? If 15.14% Muslim girls get enrolled in primary, why it gets to mere 1.49 in 12th class? So there is a huge dropout. What are the attempts? What are the efforts? What are the issues? What are the concerns? So it could be a very, it will be a very lively session. And I believe Professor Satvinder will enlighten us more about this. With this, I welcome Professor Satvinder Palkor to speak and talk about these issues. Professor Satvinder Palkor. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Navneet, Dr. Navneet for the kind words for me and good evening good morning salam namaskar satsrikal to all of uh, you who have joined and uh, thank you for initiating this discussion so my talk will have two parts uh, in the first part i'll try to draw parallels uh, between women's positioning in india and the notion of gender and marginality and in the second part, I would share the major findings of my empirical study, which we have conducted uh, as a comparative study in Punjab and Uttar Pradesh, as Dr. Navneet has just mentioned uh, now. In the Indian society, uh, gender and social relations have remained unchanged and had continued to influence the access to life opportunities of the people. From conflicts over widow remarriage and the age of consent to interconnections with caste, labor, and nationalism, the status of Indian women attracted the gaze of missionaries. For Indian conservatives, if we can, uh, if we see in the historical perspective, for the Indian conservatives, reformers and the later nationalists, women and the family became powerful symbols conveying a variety of different caste, community, and national identities. The educational inequalities continue to remain deeply entrenched in the social and political, cultural structures of the Indian society. Inequality in education opportunities has emerged as a major issue over the years. The overlapping marginalities due to caste, class, ethnicity, gender, and religion continue to produce social and educational exclusions at both visible and invisible forms. So uh, if we see 
that this topic had been the uh, uh, ca cause of concern in the every uh, Indian discourse on education. The few questions, usually uh, these remained unanswered by the many over the years. The question is how gender intersects with caste, class, religion, and region at all levels and produce multi-layer marginalities and exclusion. How do pedagogical and educational hierarchies in both formal and informal ways shape the educational experiences of girls in India? And how do deprivations and caste class marginalities become a pattern of cultural behavior for suppression in the social structure leading to persistence of intergenerational inequalities? So I would try to focus on my uh, just views and observations on basically these questions which remain unaddressed over the centuries in the Indian structure. Beginning from the pre-independence period briefly, I would just uh, like to share uh, a few uh, facts that women's education was positioned as a necessary driver of modernism and the struggle was between the conservatives who were concerned about its impact on social and familial relations and the modernizers who argued for a modern secular education. Also, the policies and programs in the independent India provided a fascinating story of how the ideological mooring on the issues of girls' education affected the every attempt. All the policies and programs attempted to address the educational issues of girls, even the Constitution of India granted equal opportunities to minorities at par with the other communities. Over the years, after the independence, India also has tried to build a sustainable, secular, democratic, just environment for the education. But these efforts could not make any uh, like dent on the existing disparities across the social groups. Consequently, over the last century, a considerable change is witnessed. Many of the girls and the women could get the sufficient levels of education, but the so many questions and the concerns remain unaddressed, which were basically focusing on the equality, justice, and the equity issues. While minority, including women, SC, ST, and other disadvantaged groups, participation is improved, as per the generic figures, literacy rates, GER, attainment levels have also improved. The intersectional analysis revealed a different picture. The sharp differences across caste, class, region, religion, gender, and the difference between haves and have-nots sharpened over the years. And the reports and the state-sponsored programs could not evolve as a system full of justice, equity, and the equality. India's positioning on women uh, development is evident from the Gender Gap Report 2020, where India ranks at the position of 112th on the overall gender gap index among 153 countries in the world. The issues of gender inequality as the axis around which marginality and exclusion happened. And as Dr. Navneet says, that the marginal, marginalization which, through which the pushing of uh, people, particularly the minority com community people at the periphery happened and the social structures remain as they were in the past. Muslim women, when we, uh, in the context of Muslim women, being born as females in the patriarchal culture and that too in the minority community are bearing the overlapping marginalities and challenges to avail equal life opportunities. They are far behind in education and empowerment in terms of literacy rates, educational levels, as well as the other human development indexes. Based on the findings of the Sachar Committee report, Muslim women in India are extremely disempowered and lack of social opportunities. They are among the most disadvantaged 
people of the society in terms of being more illiterate, politically underrepresented, and impoverished sections of society to participate in political decision making. And unfortunately, after the Sacher Committee report, none of the extensive report exclusively to address the issues of the Muslim community have been produced. Uh, if we talk in the current scenario, the current scenario uh, uh, lends certain clues which are in a way disturbing. As per the All India uh, Survey, Higher Education Survey report to 2021, at the school level, the 20% dropout is happened, though it is the state's report, because the dropout figures may not come as in the valid form in the uh, government surveys. But the state survey report says that most of the children who enroll at the primary level, they leave their studies in between before the completion. And in that chunk, a large majority are the girls. Most indicators of education, such as mean years of schooling, school attendance, levels of education, learning levels, all are lagging behind in case uh, for the uh, this disadvantaged groups. And as compared to the other SC, ST, and other disadvantaged groups, the Muslim uh, children, they are acutely dropping out from the educational system. At the higher education level, if we go the report of 1920, there is a 8% decline in the enrollment of students in the colleges and the universities over the years. When the enrollment of other communities increased, the enrollment of Muslim students in the at the higher education reduced at least 8%, which is only 76.3% of the Muslim students continue to next level of education after the elementary level. Though these are the uh, figures uh, which are coming out of the generic data and are the state uh, sponsored surveys about it. But the reality, actual, the ground level issues may uh, be more uh, acute, more disturbing figures may come. Uh, but like we have seen that during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, uh, the as we know the disasters which may be man-made or which may be uh, natural they uh, affect the vulnerable sections the most and the same happened the there is a huge dropout uh, found due to the covid in the covid after the covid period and due to the pandemic in one of the study on muslim girls in the maharashtra uh, of a 17 to 20 there was sharpened uh, like uh, learning losses among the Muslim girls because of the limited access to resources combined with surveillance, lack of support and space led to learning losses and eventual dropout from the uh, students, uh, from the, by the students from the educational uh, institutions. So uh, these kind of uh, reports, uh, they are uh, like lending a clue for the searchers and for the society that how the marginalized students, they are uh, facing the multi layers uh, of deprivations when they are not coming out, though uh, some kind of lofty uh, figures are coming out, many of the girls they are uh, reaching, like in the uh, recent report, more girls are reaching to the higher education level, but how many girls are dropping out, how many girls enter and pass the sufficient levels of education it is a big question and a concern for all. Uh, so this, uh, this is the general, uh, like uh, the screenshot of the current status as well as the historical perspective of the women education uh, in the post-independent and pre-independent India. Now, uh, based on this, because any discussion on women education needs to be located within a specific social context. Uh, because uh, the literacy and statistical figures, they are, um, they cannot uh, like leave any kind of evidence what is happening at the ground. So for that purpose, uh, 
uh, I, uh, me and uh, Mahima, we conducted a, one study in Lair Kotla. And after that, I extended this study as a comparative study uh, in the uh, on the two district cities, one Maler Kotla, which is uh, a Muslim majority city in Punjab, and the Muzaffar Nagar, which is situated in UP. And we did a, a survey on 150 girls from Muzaffar Nagar and 105 girls from Maler Kotla, including 80 girls who dropped out of the school. And all these girls were from the Muslim community in the age group of 15 to 18 years of age. The experiential realities of Muslim girls in uh, Uttar Pradesh, what are the findings, what kind of observations this, uh, the, which came out of this study is the experiential realities of Muslim girls in Uttar Pradesh and Punjab presented a totally a, a diverse picture. So, uh, somewhere a, a contrast picture was produced, though all the girls and the whole sample belong to a Muslim community. So it means um, the uh, issues are more like uh, um, uh, culture specific and issues are more uh, specific to the location and uh, also to the social structures. So the Punjab presented a different, diverse uh, picture and some commonalities are found due to the socio-cultural, economic and educational fabric of each region. In UP, Uttar Pradesh, the socio-cultural diversity shaped the educational experiences of Muslim girls differently, as evident from the inhibitions to uh, speak their mind. When we uh, when we interviewed and we discussed with the girls, they were hesitant. Uh, they had a hesitation to. Uh, share their mind about their challenges which they are facing to access the education. Whereas uh, in the Malayar Kotla, the girls were so open to uh, share about their educational experiences and the day-to-day -day realities uh, of their educational and institutional life. Whereas uh, in the Muzaffar Pur, the uh, acute uh, like hesitation and inhibition uh, was seen in the girls and they were reluctant to share about uh, the challenges and the day-to-day -day negotiation of the challenges, how they negotiate within the formal and informal settings. So this was uh, an important observation, like uh, the, they, the lack of confidence and the lack of uh, openness which was visible. Similarly, the traditional gender roles and society norms in UP posed different challenges as compared to uh, Punjab, impacting the freedom of choice for these young women. Where uh, in the Malir Kotla, the uh, girls uh, they, we found were more open and they were more aware about the educational choices and which uh, were uh, somewhere lacking, uh, like uh, only the 30% of the girls, they were clear about their choice uh, in the um, field of education and in the like uh, opting for the subjects as well as the institution. But the in the Malayar Kotla, 90% girls were open and were aware about their choices. Meanwhile, in Punjab, where distinct Punjabi culture pervades the intersection of religious and relig regional identities influenced the perception and expectation of the girls and the confidence and the freedom of choice of education and the institution were found to be more openly visible in the Punjabi Muslim girls. The economic realities uh, added another layer of complexity as economic disparities and limited access to resources in UP are impacting educational opportunities of the girls there as compared to Punjab where the economic landscape and the employment prospects uh, are found to be different as, uh, as reported by the girls. And our another uh, observation, which was uh, all the observations were interesting to the fact that despite being from the same religious community, despite being from uh, following the same ritual, same the girl, the behavior of the girls uh, were found to be different, which is uh, which is uh, very important to understand because sometimes the homogeneous kind of statements come. 
about the uh, educational issues of the uh, minorities. But uh, there is a lack of uh, like uh, viewing the uh, issues uh, in context to the particular culture. Disparities on quality of education further shape the trajectories of Muslim girls in both regions and impacting their skills. The discussion with the girls in UP which were usually left out of the rhetoric around so-called development. Sometimes the, uh, the, the elusive picture of development comes and uh, the issues of the people who are at the margin, who are at the periphery, they remain unaddressed. Uh, I have uh, certain testimonies in the form of narratives of the girls. A girl whose father was initially a tailor in uh, UP uh, uh, Taylor has lost his income due to so many reasons and is working as a salesman in the shopping mall now. The girl is dropped out after class 8th to take care of her siblings and uh, for uh, domestic work. Father's income pro proved to be a barrier to her decision to leave the uh, studies. Though this finding uh, seems so obvious, people are uh, normally saying that uh, due to poverty, girls are dropping out. But if we uh, see nowadays the narrative of uh, development, how uneven rise of urbanization, ushering of global market, free trade, and the opening up of international markets have always been accompanied by the withdrawal of the state support system, where Muzaffar Nagar seems to be a developed city. And in uh, uh, without the state support system, how the girls are bearing the brunt of uh, uh, this kind of lopsided development, which is uh, uh, witnessed uh, by the uh, situation of those people at the margin. Similarly, the Malir Kotla is city turned, uh, um, uh, like city turned uh, district uh, recently. Uh, the it is a though it is a Muslim majority city, but the other religious uh, Sikh Hindu people uh, they are living together, and there is an interfaith, inter respect, and cooperation, which is uh, more uh, predominantly came out uh, when we studied the climate and the environment of this. Um, that is why the girls they were fearlessly uh, showing their exit. Uh, their interest and their choices. They were uh, feeling like more confident and enthusiastic to pursue their studies. A vast majority of Muslim girls after dropping out of education system are engaged in household work. They are usually invisible, unacknowledged and unpaid. Again, the matrix of class and caste is visible in the work distribution also because within the Muslim community, there are classes. In the Muslim community, the girls who are the daughters of the uh, casual laborers, who are the daughters of from the low socioeconomic status, they are facing the challenges uh, like more as compared to their counterparts who are from the well-off families. So the uh, metrics of ca uh, class and the caste, as well as the um, uh, religion, they are also visible in the work distributions. Girls in poor households are burdened with significant responsibilities for the subsistence of their families. Because the, to the girls to whom we met, they are also working uh, like uh, as a paid laborers after leaving the studies. So how a family views girls' education factors a great deal into their life situations. When the family is struggling, and then the education is not the priority, particularly the daughter's education. And it is clear that the strict socialization of women starts where the ideological and the cultural uh, issues which are structured in our society are coming and the socialization of the girls starts from the childhood during which she is to prepare herself to be ideal wife and a homemaker and an ideal woman. And this has been observed during our discussions with the parents as well as the girls, because many times parents are preparing them just for their future life so that they may, uh, they may prove themselves to be uh, like ideal wives and the ideal uh, homemakers.
how identity interlocks with class and patriarchy is evident in case of restrictions imposed on the Muslim girls, particularly in the UP setting. In the Uttar Pradesh, discussions with many girls reveal that among the uneducated, them upper class, they have so many restrictions. If the school is not uh, in an approachable distance from home, the girls are simply withdrawn from the uh, education. And uh, the issue of safety uh, for the parents and the girls is uh, seen. In addition to the structural barriers, the girls reported that it is uh, media constructed social barriers and the narratives which we are witnessing in the recent times. They have greatly impacted their education and uh, the uh, of this community in India. It may be the issue of hijab or other stories splashing the minority identity. And though it is also uh, like substantiated by a study in Karnataka where thousand girls dropped out after the hijab issue from the colleges. So uh, these kind of uh, stories, which are uh, in addition to the structural ideological stories, these are like socially constructed stories in, the ter in terms of uh, uh, the new uh, uh, by media or by the uh, just uh, manufactured public opinion. So uh, the pa parents and the girls are simply withdrawn out of the um, uh, educational system. The prevalence of child marriage has also been observed in the sampled girls. Um, in uh, comparison to Punjab, more predominantly in the UP and uh, after dropping out, the parents are preparing for the marriage. And uh, also the National Family Health Survey, uh, which is state-sponsored survey, 19 to 22, there is a 41.5% of the Muslim girls, uh, whereas the overall in India is 38.2. So it is the nation, more than national average, the child marriage is prevailing in the Indian society. And uh, th this trend is uh, acute uh, in the, like in Uttar Pradesh as compared to the other developed states. Similarly, girls belonging to the poorest families have a substantially high prevalence of child marriage because uh, our interviews with the uh, dropped out girls, we uh, we found empirically that the girls who are belonging from the low income families, they are uh, more vulnerable for the child marriage as compared to the girls from the uh, economically well off families. Uh, so these kind of observations, uh, sometimes they are uh, missed by the rhetoric of uh, uh, like universalization of education and uh, all, uh, because uh, many times the contemporary discourse uh, on education focuses on the uh, figures of literacy figures or the enrollment figures. But how many uh, children, enrolled children, they complete their education uh, these kind of issues and so many uh, are uh, like silently excluded. There is exclusion when we are saying that the uh, marginality and exclusion, exclusion is uh, visible as well as invisible. Sometimes the students, uh, children, they are present in the educational system, but they are learning very less. Their participation is very poor. And eventually, after the elementary uh, levels of education, because of Right to Education Act 2009, the girls they uh, and the children, they remain almost 100%. 99.6% they remain in the school system and just after completing the elementary levels of education there is a huge dropout so uh, the girls particularly uh, after reaching the uh, puberty stage and uh, just uh, uh, adolescent stage they um, uh, they leave the school system and drop out from the uh, unfortunately uh, the contemporary social and cultural atmosphere which is uh, fundamentalist in nature, neoliberal, neocultural, market-oriented is again a challenge for the those girls who are at the margin, who are struggling for their basic, uh, um, basic uh, rights, which are uh, educational rights and uh, rather education to basic rights, because they are working more for the subsistence of their 
families to uh, to supplement the income and to supplement the other support of the family's livelihood. And also we uh, see uh, that the slogans which are much louder like Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, uh, they may not be uh, like fruitful when the expressions are coupling of girls' education with their safety are unable to change sufficiently the life conditions of many of the girls because the girls, the uh, safety and the quality education, they, they basically need uh, to, uh, because quality education, sometimes the schools are lacking the basic minimum uh, facilities. Sometimes the schools are not available in the uh, neighborhood. Sometimes the schools may not provide those kind of uh, conducive conditions for these girls. Because um, uh, in our study and in our other studies also, we, uh, we see the pedagogical experiences are also uh, not uh, directly indirectly kind of uh, exclusionary in nature and uh, for this uh, other kind of serious discourses are required and girls are withdrawn from schools which we have observed through our uh, empirical uh, uh, survey that the once they hit the puberty stage they are withdrawn from the school because of the so many practices. So despite uh, it is uh, concluded from the study that despite global strides towards gender equality in education, these girls contend with unique challenges that demand targeted interventions. Because the uniform policies, uh, like recently India has got a new education policy, which uh, uh, very ambitiously is uh, uh, like uh, supposed to address these challenges. But uh, until and un um, unless we uh, address the unique challenges by the unique groups uh, and uh, which are the location specific, social, uh, like geographically, and the social groups, uh, like specifically addressing those social groups, uh, they uh, the, the ambitions may not be fulfilled and it would be very difficult for the uh, so the policy makers also need to address these issues by conducting these studies and i would like to share with you that there's a, even no comprehensive study has been undertaken even after the covid 19 because only small how this pandemic affected the marginal population and same we have observed that the uh, sharp dropout and sharp learning losses have been occurred after the pandemic the literature and other studies also revealed that the perception of women's inferiority across various aspects of life the emphasis on upholding cultural norms to adherence to the tradition and the imperative of safeguarding Regarding the family's prestige, all these are the socially constructed issues. Because uh, what we have seen over the centuries, the, like uh, once Fule, Savitri by Fule, and other uh, women uh, reformists who worked for the women education, the women, uh, uh, and uh, after the onset of the developmental policies and the industri industrialization, the women's education has never been perceived as a human right education. The women's education is always associated uh, with the uh, fertility or with the purchase, increase in purchasing power or to um, to just substantiate the global economy and to uh, to increase her economic capacity, not as a human uh, right. So uh, the denial of human right for the um, children who are particularly from, uh, who are already from the minority uh, community and who are at the margin and from the low socioeconomic uh, state so these multiple marginalities, they continue and at the same moment, the multiple marginalities give rise to multiple deprivations. So uh, these kind of deprivations, we have to uh, be, need to be addressed uh, with the specifically 
uh, with the interventions at the policy level as well as at the uh, ground level. Barriers to education which are influencing the socio-economic factors, geographical disparities and cultural norms. So these kind of observations which uh, though these are uh, like uh, looking very obvious but uh, the one most important observation uh, and I would like to conclude with this observation is the a kind of environment which we are providing. Uh, in the uh, story of Maler Kotla, uh, you may be aware that Maler Kotla provides a very harmonious and very peaceful, just environment uh, in the locality. Like uh, Mahima and uh, we, we published uh, in a uh, mainstream weekly where we uh, just discussed it predominantly that the culture in the Malir Kotla city is uh, more safe for girls, more just, more harmonious. And girls are uh, open uh, to, for their choices. They have good, um, very uh, big aspirations to become doctors, lawyers, judges, and to, uh, for uh, the higher education. But uh, the um, it means, uh, in addition to the other facilities, the uh, provision of uh, harmonious culture, conducive environmental conditions is very important and for the education of the girls. And uh, in comparison to both the sites, the uh, Malir Kotla site and the Punjab site, it was more found to be more uh, like conducive and more uh, nurturing conditions for the girls' education as compared to the other site. So uh, with these kind of observations, I would like to conclude, Haya. Thank you so much. Uh, for inviting me for this talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I thought that you will continue for some more time, but that's okay. Uh, now, Mahima uh, is going to do some slide presentation, I think, for concluding remarks. So after that, we will have a question and answer session. Maybe that will be a longer. So welcome. Thank you. So you can share your slide whenever you can do on your own. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. You, okay, wonderful. I'm just going to make sure it looks... Okay, I think you can all see it. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Mahima Gupta. Take um, enough time. This? Take enough time. No problem. Perfect. That sounds wonderful. So to conclude this talk, I just wanted to provide a brief case study into the educational experiences of Muslim girls in Malir Kotla. Um, I had completed a Fulbright Nehru Research Scholarship in 2022 under the mentorship of Professor Sassinder Ma'am. And this presentation will just be a very broad overview of some of the findings that we found in Malir Kotla. And we will also discuss then how the Malir Kotla experience relates to the Muslim experience in India. Um, Sassinder Ma'am did a wonderful job of presenting a lot of this data. So some of this might be repeated, but I wanted to once again just highlight the wonderful findings of Malir Kotla. So for a brief roadmap of what I'll be presenting and discussing, I'll go over the background and history of Malir Kotla, talk about some of my experiences and perceptions um, before conducting field research. As you can probably tell by my accent, I'm from the US, so a lot of my experiences when it comes to Muslim girls education and the context that I carried will be a little bit different just because of where I grew up. And then lastly, um, I'll discuss the methodology and field research findings. So first for some background and history into Malir Kotla. Um, so Malir Kotla, um, there's a Punjab map um, on the screen and you can see the red arrow pointing to where Malir Kotla is, but it's a city and district um, located in Punjab and it's fairly close to Ludhiana. And like Sathin their man mentioned, it's a recent city turned district and it attained district status in 2021. And it is Punjab's only remaining Muslim majority city since partition, um, is considered a havens of tolerance um, with inter-religious um, harmony. In fact, during partition, eyewitnesses and participants of the violence against Muslims reported that they did not touch any Muslim refugee who entered Malir Kotla because they believed they were honoring the wishes of Guru Gobind Singh. Um, this tolerance has continued in recent years, for example, during the Citizenship Amendment Act and in the farmers' protests. Um, Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs in this region did march together and they supported each other. And in addition to this major historical tolerance, as a new district, um, Malir Kotla has also experienced um, significant infrastructure investments, including a girls' college, a medical college, and a women's-only police station. 
So in addition to the Miller Coltless history to prepare myself for field research, I really had two key resources to go off of to begin formulating um, my research questions and to begin understanding the community. The first was the media, like Sister Binderman had um, briefly discussed, and then the second was government reports and data. So when you see um, Muslim Girls Education India online, when you look at the headlines, you'll see different phrases like the ones on the screen. You'll see um, articles about the hijab ban or lower rates of enrollment or words like stopping education or backwardsness. So from reading the news articles, I started to think that maybe because of discriminatory laws, um, such as the hijab ban, xenophobia, or anti-Muslim sentiments, in addition to possible cultural norms, that there could be a gap um, in the education of Muslim girls in India. The 2011 census, which is also the most recent data that we have that's countrywide, also shows a clear achievement gap for Muslim women when it came to literacy. So then their ma'am had discussed these um, numbers as well, but according to the census, only about half of the Muslim women in India were literate. And though Sangrua district and Malirkotla cities, um, female literacy was higher than 52%, um, it is still significantly lower than the all India average of 74% literacy and Punjab's female literacy rate of 70%. So why Malirkotla? Um, so based on my initial secondary research, I understood that Muslim uh, women achieve lower literacy rates and school enrollment rates than both India's overall population, as well as the female population. It also seemed that due to fear of discrimination and recent policies like the hijab ban, there could be also impact to enrollment rates. And because of all of these factors, I found that due to its unique religious tolerance and the emphasis on women's rights, Malir Kotla offers the opportunity to evaluate the educational experiences and future aspirations of Muslim girls without having to take into consideration the same heightened levels of locally based violence, discrimination, and exclusion that is faced by Muslim girls in other communities throughout India. So based on this initial secondary research and the hypothesis development, that's when I started towards the field research. Um, so for this process, I interviewed 45 girls in Malir Kotla through mixed qualitative methods. Um, the girls that I had met with were from the ages of 12 to 16, enrolled in grades 6 to 10. And I also interviewed additional stakeholders, including um, school principals, higher education administrators, teachers, and senior female students. And I gained these Malaria Kotla contacts through the Punjab University Network, including since then their MAM's um, connections. And the Malaria Kotla um, host family that I connected with, um, they're on the screen right now. They were also very instrumental um, in building these connections with local schools. So some of the questions that I asked was, so I conducted um, basically qualitative field research. So I basically knocked on different school doors and I asked to speak with students and asked to speak with girls. And I basically gathered into rooms regularly with young girls, the ones that I showed before. And the questions that I asked them included, um, what do you envision for your future? And what would you like to do when you grow up? What city do you picture yourself living in and why? How do your parents feel about your future goals? Can you describe your daily routine on a school day or a weekend? And do you have any older sisters? And if so, what are they currently doing? I went to three schools in Malir Kotla for interviews. I went to the Islamic Girls Senior Secondary School, which is an all girls Muslim school that is Vak Board affiliated and funded. Um, the school's um, students were about 30 to 40% below the poverty line, 30% lower middle class, and 10 to 20% middle class. I'd also visited Al Fala Senior Secondary School, which is a co ed Muslim and Vak Board affiliated and funded school with a majority middle class or upper middle class student body. And then lastly, I went to the Government Smart High School, which is a co ed secular public school, and the majority of the students here were below the poverty line or lower middle class. Um, so here are some of the data points that I found, some of my key findings. 75% um, of girls hope to pursue a professional career that requires a master's or above. 25% of girls either want to stay in Malir Kotla or they hope to move to larger cities nearby. 100% of girls expressed that their parents were supportive of their career and ambitions. 25% of girls hope to pursue an alternative career path, um, which is outside of that college structure or were undecided on future goals. 75% of girls expressed an interest in the ILATS in studying or moving abroad. And 66% um, felt that the community had equal treatment of girls and boys when it came to education.
I do think it's important to note um, that I primarily use focus groups and interviews for these findings, and I often post questions to multiple people at once, so not every girl answered every question. And in addition, naturally, some girls were more talkative than others, um, and I would never want to pressure anyone into answering a question that they did not want to answer. So while I often ask these girls if they are agreed or disagreed with statements, I also often relied on um, nonverbal cues such as head nods or hand raising to understand these different opinions and consensus. So basically, there might be some variation in these actual percentages on the screen, but they're mostly there to represent overall trends that we found. And here are some of the main takeaways that um, we found from conducting the field research. The first is the same one that Malera Kotla discussed. Um, the stuff in there, I'm discussing about Malera Kotla. It's that um, Malera Kotla offers an alternative story to Muslim girls' education in India that diverges from the popular perceptions and media portrayals. The girls that um, I interviewed were all extremely ambitious and care about their education and future careers. Most girls express an interest in moving to a larger um, city for higher education. Um, the majority of the girls hope to move to the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Some girls expressed um, that their parents felt more comfortable actually sending their kids abroad than allowing them to go to larger cities in India outside of Punjab due to perceptions of anti-Muslim sentiments. So basically, many parents thought it was safer to send their girls maybe to America versus sending them to Mumbai, for example. And then despite the um, girls' ambitions, um, the adults that I interviewed discussed the barriers that they faced in reaching the goals. And these barriers um, included um, financial constraints, lower value on girls' education, community and marriage pressure, and low workforce participation rates. And honestly, all these findings, um, they might not sound very interesting or provocative. Most of the girls that I met with could be characterized as being from lower middle class households. Their parents were supportive of them, but only to the amount that their financial situation allowed them to be. Um, I remember having a conversation with a couple of research mentors from the U.S. and they talked about for publication, um, we really have to show that how Malir Kotla is failing and what different solutions we can present to them. But the reality is Malir Kotla isn't failing when it comes to girls' education. And here are some additional findings um, from my field work. In the interest of time, I won't go over all of them. However, in my opinion, the most important finding um, and the one that resonated with me the most is that um, with the state that India is in today, um, researching a Malir Kotla really does provide an understanding of how people are able to balance their religious identity with their secular values, their cultural pride, and a desire to modernize and create a better life for their children. And after working in Malir Kotla, honestly, I think I just felt a lot of hope and pride and potential in the education experiences that Muslim girls can have and should have. And with that, uh, thank you so much. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, getting to speak with all of you. I really also enjoyed getting to learn about what Sidvinder Man had to say. Despite um, being in India with her for nine months, I never got to attend one of her lectures. So that was also a really big enjoyment. And then also thank you to all of the girls on the screen. They were all just very wonderful in getting to know and they were so knowledgeable and special people. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very interesting research study and we learned a lot today. So before going to question and succession, just an announcement for the coming Saturday event, if you do all different kind of events. So um, coming Saturday is from Aligarh Muslim University Cultural Center, uh, Zab Zaban Daraz. And so this is a collaborative effort that is going on since a couple of months. So we are going to um, get this uh, from the cultural center. Uh, over to Dr. Rafat Hussain, who is going to moderate the question and answer session. And there are plenty of probably uh, questions and people should ask because this is on a very, very sensitive topic, very important for at least the Muslim community. And uh, it raises a lot of questions really. And welcome you all. Uh, over to Dr. Fatusan. Thank you, Dr. Raziuddin. So, session is open for question and answer. Those who are interested, please raise your digital hand or put your question in the chat section. So, let's begin with the digital hand. Uh, Dr. Saeed Zadi, and after that, uh, Imtiaz Saab. So, I have uh, two questions. First one is, uh, is uh, the religious uh, or minority uh, marginality 
is it due to religion social factors or political factors so that and uh, because he studied two areas but in general whole india uh, so that's first question second is what is the what is the change happened pre partition post partition and now since modi's time so that's uh, if anybody can give me some guideline how is it trajectory is the same is going down or is flat thank you okay who wants to take it dr kaur professor kaur unmute yourself please i i would take the yeah. second question after professor kaur takes up the okay yeah okay uh, yeah regarding the first question uh, what are the factors uh, social uh, political economic actually uh, there is a, uh, no one factor which is behind the educational deprivation uh, there is a interplay of different factors so we have to be uh, clear at this uh, um, point because there is an interplay and uh, multiple factors which uh, work against the education of the Muslim minority girls and other minority, education of other minority groups also, which may be tribal or uh, uh, scheduled caste or other, uh, even the rural uh, girls minority, they are also rural girls, regional minority also. So uh, there are interplay of different factors which affect, in one case, predominantly is the one factor and in, it, it depends upon case to case. That is why uh, we are uh, more endorsing the point, more focusing on the specific uh, challenges and the specific issues which are uh, uh, like uh, social context, cultural context, political context sometimes. So it, it depends. That is why the comparison of two sides are uh, providing uh, some insights about uh, this thing. I think I have answered this uh, question. Um, yeah. Just to add uh, the question from Dr. Javed Hossain in the similar lines, are there any external political factors uh, involved? External, uh, Javed, uh, yeah. External political factors, because over the years, like... Uh, uh, when the new liberal new liberalism is coming more sharply, more income inequalities are coming, more uh, like the developmental uh, rhetoric of the development discourse and more narratives are coming and uh, the uh, corporate control of media and uh, other uh, institutions is coming. Then uh, when these kind of uh, developmental policies come, so it is obvious that the marginal are are the more vulnerable groups in this kind of developmental discourse. So uh, when the um, social, cultural, ideological, and other structural factors work, then these fact then the these new developmental factors they also substantiate uh, the acuteness of the working against. Uh, the educational aspiration of the girls. So uh, these are factors and factors are also uh, like I have already uh, said that these are also the uh, like area specific, culture specific, location specific. When the people are more liberal, when the people are more open, when there is a, there is a interrespect in the people, more harmony, more peace in the environment, then these uh, the effect of these uh, factors uh, little reduced but when these factors uh, are then when the uh, culture and the environmental conditions are not like uh, more harmonious then the uh, the uh, uh, again other factors they working they work more aggressively and they ha hardly hit uh, the vulnerable sections so uh, these uh, these are not very linear uh, kind of uh, observations which we can isolate from one another there is a complexity uh, of the issues and which are uh, like the social science research and rigorous researchers and uh, they may uh, like uh, find some insights regarding the actual uh, factors behind this deprivation yeah. dr sharma okay. yes uh, 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 professor kaur has done much justice to the topic but i was 
very much interested to the question where where this uh, question was raised that can there be a trajectory seen into pre-partition, post-partition and Modi's time that how Muslim girls' education is working up in India. Of course, there was a kind of response which was a response to colonial onslaught where we had Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan Sahib and we had Alama Iqbal who responded to the issues of Muslim uh, girl child education in a very different manner. Then, of course, uh, uh, there were people like Sheikh Abdullah and Wahid Begum who opened the Aligarh uh, school for girls. And there was these Pardanashi Madalsas which came up in Bhopal, Calcutta. And in post-partition, though, though there were many commissions and committees which specifically talked about Muslim girls, uh, but uh, nothing came up that concretely. Uh, that we could say that this substantial step was taken up. Even the Satche Committee's report also pointed out that there should be more schools in Muslim-dominated areas and there should be uh, only girl schools for Muslim girls for, for from 9th to 12th class. So this was one of the uh, first recommendation. And if you look at the dropout rate that one of uh, in one of my piece I have pointed out, that uh, since 2014 to 2023, the dropout rate has gone ahead. And more Muslim girls, be it the hijab issue and the external political factor which Javed Saab was asking. Yes, there are external political factors and political economic factors which do have their influence on education as a system. And this hijab controversy, as Mahima also pointed out, and Professor Kaur also pointed out, that there was an exodus from the schools and colleges. And probably now the ball is being rolled up back again with the Congress government at, Bengal, at Karnataka. So that political tussle and turbulence, of course, affects uh, people. And more so when you are in a minority. And more so when you are already... Uh, living in a cornered, uh, polarized, and uh, that kind of times. Thank you, Sharma. Um, the next is uh, Intiasa. Thank you, Professor Kaur, for sharing your research with us. It was informative. The regional disparities, like between Punjab and UP, you mentioned, there were established, I should not say well-known, simply because the mindset of Muslims of UP is very deficient in many respects, and that reflects in the performance of Muslim girls in education. My question is, several years ago, I was at Jam um, Jama Masjid area of Delhi, and I was talking with somebody who several generations that family has been written. He was very educated person, he mentioned that the problems we are facing, our girls are having, this is like 10 years ago, our girls are better educated than the boys, and they are having difficulty marrying less educated men where the arrogance of the ignorant is a problem for them. Second, the other choice is they remain unmarried or marry outside the community, and he was quite concerned. Has anybody, I mean, is it just one person's experience or impression or does some study, is there a study on this subject? Yeah, so uh, it is not, I think uh, the story which you have narrated by one person, it is uh, most common in the uh, families from low socioeconomic background. And uh, in our study, uh, 10 to uh, 10 to 13 percent of the parents, they were uh, reluctant to uh, send their girls for the higher education because of the uh, matrimonial uh, issue, because of the unavailability of match and also the educated uh, boy. So uh, this is common, but uh, uh, I think it is uh, it is not a very uh, new uh, phenomena. It is happening in the other communities also. 
it is not only in the like uh, we can say this muslim girls it is in another other communities also who are uh, poor families who are from this uh, low socio economic background they have the problem of the finding the suitable match for the educated girls and also uh, to spend money on marriages and also the affordability of dowry uh, and all these things so this is common somewhere where girls somehow how they can get the education or some times higher education so they are facing this kind of issue actually the uh, problem is the economic factor is the major factor because nowadays when the employment opportunities are shrinking and uh, the more unorganized sector is coming predominantly and the parents are not finding themselves uh, jobs and the regular employment so the uh, because it is uh, like the sociological studies clearly say that when the family any crisis in the family comes so it is only the girl whose education will be affected uh, then then the boys or the uh, son so uh, this is uh, like uh, it is a common and it is more related to the economic capacity of the family thank you thank you dr kaur professor kaur next is uh, rudranshu Welcome back, Rudranshu. Where were you? Well, I was in some sort of a trouble. Now I have walked over that trouble, so I will be joining you more frequently. Okay. My and good good evening to all the panelists and all the members of Washington diaspora. My question would be that uh, Muslim girls have been invisible, even in the Muslim community, and their education instigates fear that if they are too well educated they will marry outside religion or outside caste that is a visible and a tangible fear in rural areas now what what can the rich and opulent muslims do for female education in the muslims and the rich and opulent and influential non muslims do this is my question for the education of muslim females Thank you, Rudraj. Okay, who wants to take uh, Dr. Sharma or Professor Kaur? Or uh, Ms. Go ahead. I uh, would love to answer that, or I would take up, and I'll leave a few, few flags to, to to respond to that idea. Of course, class is of course an economic category which can't be negated that what rich and opulent Muslims and what rich and opulent Hindus, or for that matter, belonging to any religion does. But religion is also one of the factor which, which contributes a lot, which contributes a lot. And we can see the difference. And of course, the idea that you were pointing out, even when Iqbal and Sal Sayyid Ahmed Khan Sahib responded to the idea of uh, Muslim girl education, uh, uh, it was uh, said for a time that Muslim girls should be taught only to read, not to write, because then they will write love letters to their parables. So this was also an understanding which was given. For example, there is a recent survey about digital divide. Boys have more access to mobile phones than girls, because then girls can run away with their lovers. And this is one of the understanding. And look, when, when we talk about Muslim girls, there, there are too many geoparties which are working at it, being the minority, being the minority within the minority. And this idea of double geoparty has, has only become more cliche during these times, that, that how these are working. So obviously there could be a class difference also, but external factors like religion and caste also work more dominant in any patriarchal setup. And patriarchy gets more emboldened by, by issues like caste and religion, besides the economic category. Thank you. So there is a question from Dr. Rajesh Kumar, who is also from, who is from Women's History Department, Punjab University. So he has a two-part question how to tackle the dropout rate of the girls among marginalized community, especially during COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 scenario. So uh, the second question is, can we understand the complex uh, 
socio cultural socio economic reality of our society by not looking into uh, the live live experience uh, perspective and contribution of br ambedkar and uh, some other people so he is from punjab university and uh, dr kaur yeah uh, uh, rajesh uh, you uh, regarding your first question how to stop the dropout actually this is the question which is uh, like over the decades which is uh, like a, always a question and which is uh, remain unanswered because we have reduced dropout uh, like uh, after rte or we have reduced dropout figures only not actual dropout sometimes the figures are impressive like the dropout is reduced but actual dropout is uh, happening so uh, like uh, after without understanding the factors which are actually behind the drop out of the children from the education so, girls in particular without understanding the factors we have to holistically understand the factors which are working against the education of the children and which are compelling them to leave the education in between before completing uh, or before getting sufficient levels so first to understand those factors unfortunately our uh, our uh, policies they without understanding the factors sometimes the blanket statements like uh, uh, education for all or uh, these uh, like uh, for example the mid day meal mid day meal uh, was the fascinating scheme which was introduced at that time to provide nutrition to the but uh, nobody could understand that many of the children they just come to the school just for the mid meal so what are the other factors what are the background variables which are affecting their education how their family uh, conditions decide about their education how the poor learning levels decide about the education like uh, just now navneet is saying the digital divide Uh, the surveillance and lack of uh, like uh, facilities at home because uh, even during pandemic we abruptly uh, shifted to the online education nobody could think about the factors which are affect which will affect the uh, uh, online education and that is why the huge learning loss and huge uh, drop out from the education uh, school education happened due to the pandemic but unfortunately no study uh, no survey which comprehensively can present the picture of the effects of uh, Uh, covid 19 has been uh, like undertaken or no, none of the report rather uh, recently the unicef's report the edtech ed tragedy you must have seen that when unicef is cautioning all of you that uh, it was a tragedy to use the technology for the uh, to continue the just uh, education during the pandemic it was the it was the hasty decision it was more so without understanding the factors uh, rajesh it is uh, it is impossible to uh, because we can't diagnose the problem we can temporarily uh, diagnose the problem but the permanent solutions are lying uh, after the deeper understanding of the factors uh, i hope i have answered your question yeah first question thank you and the next question uh, i mean the other question from dr is uh, let me read again can we understand the complex socio cultural socio economic reality of our society by not looking into the experience perspective and contribution of b r ambedkar jyoti ba phule fatma etc et hmm. yeah uh, navneet would you answer or i i answer this question? i'll i'll just flag uh, two three things and then you can probably take okay. it okay 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 i'll i'll just say that uh, the idea which uh, professor satinder was talking about is quite uh, important and she mentioned it that there are no serious studies undertaken post covid and pre covid scenarios and uh, as nidhi you can see in the chat box she has pointed out rightly well that we don't uh, see it as a matter of drop out it's more of a matter of being pushed out so of course like dalits we can also see the issue of muslim girls 
first the concern is bringing them to the school once they are the, inside the school then we need to struggle to bring them into the classroom and once they are in the classroom then we need to struggle to bring them into pedagogical process so exclusion of muslim girls happens at all three levels when when uh, muslim girls are not allowed to go to school once they reach school they are not allowed inside classroom once they are inside classroom curriculum pedagogy and language and evaluation processes also excludes them so there are multiple layers of exclusion and marginality as what professor satinder was talking about and i'll just say that look life experiences of whether baba saab or whether jyotiba phule or gramshi frere fuko they provide us the language of the discourse and the language of the discourse also plays a prominent role in the politics of education so when when gramshi says subalternity and when when frere says oppression these are the terms and lexicons of understanding these things it is not that one's experience will be generalized but these are the vocabularies which help us to understand the issue per se okay thank you dr nazir ahmed and then dr and then anamika sharma thank you very much uh, i would like to uh, pick up on uh, the comment that uh, professor satvinder made about uh, the impact of poverty economics on as an independent variable uh, but first a couple of brief comments one there's always this tendency to extrapolate and generalize the data from uttar pradesh and around the environments of delhi to the rest of india which is not always true the experience of southern india is very different secondly in my presentation i travel all through karnataka southern india maharashtra delhi western up and eastern um parts of um, haryana my observation was that in the 8 to 12 grade uh, uh, in, in groups of uh, students there were more and more girl babies girl children amongst the muslims than there were boys as india so pointed out especially in southern india we find that more boys drop out because of pressures of poverty than girls my question is has there been an independent study that shows um empir empirically the differential dropout rates between different communities not as a function of all the other variables but only as a function of income levels thank you nazir saab before you answer the question there is a similar uh, uh, comment from sam krishnan so you can answer both as udisc and all india survey on higher education reflect that enrollment of muslim girls are decreased in primary education and increase in higher secondary as uh, higher secondary education why and what are the factors so both are similar question please go ahead dr sharma or dr kaur <laughs> the dropout uh, rate is higher in boys Let, and... uh, yeah so go ahead i I'm, okay i may answer uh, i would like try to uh, give answer of the first question which is uh, like the income uh, income factor factor of income yeah uh, the dropout uh, like dropout uh, of boys and girls is almost sim same in uh, many of the states in india in case of muslim community because of uh, the so many factors in for the boys the uh, employment and uh, the income generation for the family is the dominating factor 
Whereas uh, in the uh, similar case, when the family is uh, of the humble background, when the background economic background is weak, then the girls, they are uh, dropping out due to certain other reasons, which we already have mentioned. But the economic uh, factor, the fragile economic condition of the family uh, is a dominating factor behind the educational deprivation and behind the leaving of the educational studies for both the daughter as well as the son. But what we have seen in our study, sometimes when due to the poor family conditions, it is the first daughter which is being withdrawn from the school and second is the son. So ultimately, uh, the number and the percentage comes to the uh, similar, uh, same level, th that both boys. Actually, the, uh, generally the issue is the education of the families because education is not the priority when the family is struggling for the livelihood and the minimum uh, facilities, minimum conditions for the family. So you are right that so many uh, states, the boys are exceeding in dropping out than the girls, but the difference is not substantial. Very small marginal differences there between the both. But in some states, the girls are uh, dropping out more as compared to boys. Yes, uh, poverty is the major factor behind their dropping out. So I think... Um, I have answered this question. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the question was on the uh, another question. So for Muslim girls, the enrollments are decreased in primary education and increased in higher secondary. If that is correct, why? Uh, I'll just quickly respond to the tiger because Professor Satinder has quite in detail talked about these issues. But yes, uh, uh, there have been studies that besides poverty, it is also the lack of the washroom facilities and lack of the caregivers at home. These were the two primary reasons that why girls largely and Muslim girls more dropped out of the education. So it's not always the poverty. It's about other infrastructural issues and constraints also for which uh, Muslim girls have dropped out of it. And uh, the question about this UDISC survey, where it has been pointed out that the enrollment for primary education of Muslim girls has decreased, whereas it has increased in higher secondary. So if you read the data, you'll find out that those who are once enrolled in primary education, they carry up to the higher education, but the dropout at the very primary level happens. So you can see that shift. You can see that shift that more and more Muslim girls are getting pushed out of the education system at the very primary level. And those who survive, out of which the significant number is also not reaching to higher secondary, but that looks better because the push, push out rate is higher at primary level. So when you look at the push out rate at senior secondary level or at higher level, in fact, you look at it that only 1.9% out of the 15% of uh, women, uh, child who are left at primary school reach to senior secondary. So that number looks better, but the story stops at the primary level itself. Thank you so much. Uh, the next person is Anamika Sharma. Rafat, let me know when you leave, okay? Yeah, that would be the last question. And then you can follow up uh, one question from uh, iPhone in chat box. Okay. Okay, please go ahead, uh, Anamika. Unmute yourself, please. Oh. Oh. Anamika, uh, yeah, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay, so we can come back to Anamika. Um, uh, Poras Dada Bhai, please. 
Yes, uh, I'd like to ask a question of to of Makima Gupta. Uh, she mm -hmm. has not answered anybody as yet. Yeah. Uh, but... <laughs> uh, child, child, child marriage is not just a problem in Muslims. It's a it's a problem all over India. India has the highest number of child marriages that prevent people from education. So that's an issue for all communities. I was really impressed by your work. Uh, did you see any signs of mental, mental, mental health care or wellness or mental health for the students in the schools as to why they were dropping out right. while you were there? And also, what are your thoughts on child marriage? And should is that a major cause of low rates? Muslim girls are doing very well in the United States. I see them at Loyola University. I see them at Illinois Benedictine University. And their employment, and they tend to go more so into religious schools than state schools. Is that your experience? Thank you. Um, so I can attempt to uh, answer some of those questions, and I might defer to Sister their ma'am and to Dr. Sharma to take over, just because um, they definitely have more experience than me in understanding the status of Muslim girls and the status of India in general. But um, to answer one of your questions, when you um, were asking about the mental health state of girls, I think a major part of mental health um, in children comes from their parents and their encouragement. I think what made all of the girls I met with unique was the fact that all of their parents were very encouraging of their education ambitions. So I met with people um, with a very broad um, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, all the way from wealthier students who were at that private school with the upper middle class um, backgrounds, all the way to the kids in the government schools who came from uh, more impoverished backgrounds. And in every case, the answers were the same. And it was that their parents were very encouraging of their ambitions. It doesn't necessarily mean those ambitions can come true because of financial constraints, but those parents did prioritize their education and encourage them to work hard. I think another factor that's in place in Malerko, and I briefly discussed that in the chat box, but um, qualitatively what I saw was the fact that um, Malir Kotla's um, women population, like the mothers of these children, they were participating in the workforce at higher rates. Um, many of them are seamstresses, tailors, they work in factory industries. Malir Kotla actually, they have, um, they produce badges for the Indian army and they're known for being the largest producers of Indian flags. So they have a very large economy where women participate. So I think that's another thing when it comes to mental health. These women were not saying, no, your school doesn't matter. You're going to stay at home eventually. But they were saying, no, you're going to work one day. You have to support your kids. So I can maybe answer that brief um, answer when it comes to mental health, just discussing the fact that their mothers and their fathers were encouraging other education. But when it comes to your other questions um, with child marriage, I didn't see instances of child marriage because all of my research was solely focused in schools and none of those girls were at a risk for that. They all were hoping to go to college afterwards, but perhaps it's been their ma'am or um, Dr. Sharma, maybe they can um, take over in answering those second parts of your question. Thank you. Navneet, yeah. Any of I you? have one question for Navneet, if am I allowed? Uh, let let them first finish and then. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to say further anything in this? Any of you, Dr. Kaur or Sharma? No. Then we can move on to other question. Okay. Razi no... Bhai, before I leave, I wanted to thank uh, all the speakers. Oh, sure. uh, Professor Kaur and uh, Ms. Gupta and Dr. Sharma. I'm sorry, I have to leave for another urgent meeting. Thank you so much. And Razib, I will take over from here. All right. All right. Thank okay. you. Very sorry much. about that. Thank you very much. So the next question, let's move on to other questions. Uh, Anamika Sharma, please. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hello, Anamika Sharma, you wanted to ask some question? Please unmute yourself, yes. Uh, maybe some connection problem. So let's move on to Dr. Abdul Jabbar. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, wonderful discussion uh, today, as always. Uh, this is something very, uh, very important to me, a lot of other people in this forum as well. So I, I thought it's very comprehensive what uh, Professor talked about, different, uh, uh, the uh, very comprehensive in terms of social, political, religious, uh, a spectrum. I think uh, I think this is the one of the best presentations I I uh, listened to um, here on uh, this in this forum. Also, the case study. Uh, I just wanted to uh, focus on that. Uh, Malak Malakotna Malak Malakotna. Uh, so I am from the south. I I came from a, a small place. Uh, so that's a remarkable place in terms of. Uh, the tolerance uh, you talked about, the uh, kind of uh, society, uh, community that built, even right from the uh, partition, even before pre-partition. So, what is that? What is that unique about the place? What is that? What? What? If you you you, you see the results, uh, outwardly in schools and communities, so that that place is somehow anchored in some sort of uh, uh, tolerance uh, juice or something. <laughs> so what is that about? What is that, uh, uh, why that is very unique? That is my kind of, uh, uh, this, I wanted, uh, if you have some time, you can dwell, if you have information on that, because I come from Paniculum. That's a Paniculum is the southernmost part of Dendi on the core uh, uh, in uh, Rameshwaram coast. So predominantly Muslim, we are away from the partition areas, but we are very tolerant. I never had any issues, even the predominant Muslim community. My my teachers were, uh, 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 you know, uh, Christians and other other religious. Uh, that still continues to the same. So I think I want to uh, uh, kind of uh, ask you uh, uh, whether you have any insight into this place. Thank okay. you. Wonderful. Thank you. That is actually my question too. What oh, okay. is unique? Because all these communities, yeah. Hindus, Sikhs, or Christians, or uh, other communities, live in other towns too, uh, along with Muslims. Yes. So there must be some kind of model that we can create out of this. Mar mar Again, I'm also uh, Malar Kotla. What is so? I mean, is this a history, it has a history. Why this is such a history? I mean, why it doesn't affect people there as it has affected or poisoned people elsewhere? So that could be a very good clue to use that as a model. And maybe the communities who are concerned can really look into that. Please go ahead. Ji, Satvinder Ji, you don't yeah, no, nee, no. Nee. Uh, hello. I wanted to say this question ke, uh, regarding. So very actually, uh, this uh, Malerikotla uh, is a small city which is a newly turned uh, district. It has a historical significance uh, because uh, if uh, we, uh, we go in the history of the Malerikotla, uh, the Sikh Guru Gobind Singh, 10th Guru of the Sikh religion, uh, and uh, their sons, so Jinko Sahab Jada Kahajata, I hope you will understand uh, you all uh, Hindi. Wo Sahab Jada Kijo Shahidi Hui. Okay, so Shahidi K time, Jo Malir Kotla K Nawab Thi. Un Nawab Ne, he was uh, though uh, the sons. Uh, sorry, they sorry, were, sorry, sorry, they sorry were, to interrupt they, you. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Some of us won't be able to understand in Hindi. Urdu. Okay, Hindi. Okay, so fine, fine. It has to go on okay. the English. Sorry. Okay, okay. So, um, Lirikotla has a historical significance because particularly in the Sikh history, it is an example when uh, the sons of uh, called Sahib Jadas of 10th Guru Gobind Singh, they were martyred by the Nawab there, Subha Sarhand who was called Subha Sarhan, and one Nawab from Lerkotla, 
he wo he uh, just uh, stood up in uh, uh, against uh, suba sarhan for the uh, to save those uh, children sons of guru gobind singh and from that day from that moment because he stood up uh, in favor of them and he said that there should not be no revenge which should be taken from the children you can take the revenge he openly told to vidhi suba that you don't kill uh, these ch ch children you can kill their father but not the children so uh, th these words uh, they were written like in golden letters in the sikh history and the sikh people uh, they have immense uh, respect for uh, they had res uh, respect for the nawab of mlerkotla and after that even during the partition no bloodshed happened in the mlerkotla nobody was tortured muslim community all muslim people they were settled down there they they started their life there though they were under fear under terror but the people from there both hindu and sikh families they protected them then they ensured them to provide the safe space and uh, if you uh, you can't believe that the sikh gurudwara people they donated uh, some land to established uh, mosques there so so many mosques are established and the coexistence of one mandir masjid and the gurudwara at the same space and they are living in a harmony and mutual respect even nowadays Uh, like in the last days so many uh, like if the farmer struggle happened in india uh, two day years back then the muslims were in the support any kind of problem pain they are sharing all and there is a harmony and respect because there is a no distinction nothing kind of identity crisis or culture so this is a unique example as you are saying there must be other examples where the communal harmony is there where peaceful tall culture of tolerance is there and malerkotla is a space so we we also try through our study to locate this thing how the peaceful environment is conducive for the education of the children particularly as maima has mentioned the environment of tolerance culture of interfaith inter respect mutual understanding cooperation that also work for the education of the uh, girls and the children there so that is why the people they are preferring to send their girls anywhere the girls feel safe and they are there so the malerkotla's history is unique i may miss certain important uh, facts but uh, the historians sikh particularly sikh historians can uh, um, better tell and there are so many articles on the uh, malerkotla's history why this kind of communal harmony is witnessing this uh, city is witnessing at this moment and though uh, there are certain issues and narratives which are coming like uh, in the contemporary times but it is not uh, like affecting the kind of culture the malerkotla is exhibiting and the kind of harmony they are uh, practicing in their day to day life so that is why the malerkotla is a kind of unique culture of peace uh, which provides a space to everyone to every religion to every uh, faith and to uh, um, like a free space and the liberal kind of uh, uh, environment is there no fear and no tension yeah wonderful thank you anamika anamika sharma are you ready am i audible now am i audible yes. now yes yes please go ahead sorry i had some problem with my mic no problem uh, thank you dr pal uh, dr sharma and maima for this insightful talk it was truly enlightening so i have certain questions or you can say comments to add to what has already been said by our uh, speakers i think as much as we are talking about the issue of redistribution of resources an opportunity i think we also need to talk about the issues of redistrib uh, recognition also which actually contribute equally in pushing uh, muslim women out of the school as much as the issues of uh, resources uh, and opportunities are doing 
so and i think this is actually pertinent for education of not only muslim women but uh, for all other marginalized groups also who face the kind of uh, cultural imperialism in their uh, educational institution also and in the broader societal context also because we see that those living under cultural imperialism they, they often find themselves defined from the outside because they are positioned and placed by a network of dominant meaning and this dominant meaning is something that is arising from the elsewhere and this is not something that they can actually identify with this is something that is alien to them and this dominant meaning actually presents them in a inferiorized and stereotyped image it presents a very stereotyped image of them so what i think this creates in marginalized groups also is a kind of double consciousness for them and i think this is one of the major reason why they are pushed out of the school because they lack recognition they they are not they do not recognize with the kind of image of themselves that are presented to them so it's it's like it's a like measuring one soul by the tape that is given by the world which actually sees them in 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 a, in kind of a stereotype manner in amusement in contempt or in uh, pity so this kind of double consciousness that arises them we need to see how it is actually contributing in pushing them out of the school because when they refuse to actually coincide with this devalued objectified and uh, stereotyped version of them that is imposed by on them uh, by dominant uh, dominant meanings and they desire recognition as uh, humans who are actually full of uh, capabilities and possibilities so this kind of double consciousness actually arises in them so i think we need to see how it is contributing to them pushing out of the school and how education and pedagogy can actually address this type of issue and foster positive recognition for them in society and i think we also need to see how it how it education and uh, the policies that are actually crafted for them can actually address the intersectional nature of oppression that they face in society because of being situated at the intersection of this uh, a marginalized religion and a marginalized gender because uh, what because the, the kind of oppression and the marginalization that muslim women face it is very different from the those faced by uh, muslim men and hindu women so it is not just the sum of the religion religious and gender discrimination but it is shaped by the intersection of these two so we need to see how can education and the policies that are crafted for them can actually uh, address this and we can see this in the case of i think malayar court also that how this intersection of their identity as a muslim and as a woman is actually contributing to their and uh, to their educational uh, marginalization and how it is uh, actually shaping their educational experience thank you thank you so is there is, was that just a commentary or was there a question yeah, yeah anybody can comment on that <laughs> they can share their observation on this if anybody wants to say anything or that is good enough i mean i want to just add an to... observation in itself and the comment itself had many of the answers to the question which probably anamika had raised and the idea of dominant meaning and how muslim girls are getting excluded marginalized and oppressed and are been uh, victimized to this alternative are some of the issues which need to be looked into detail and there is much space of more studies to be undertaken what satyendra pal ji and mahima has undertaken so it 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 motivates more and it asks us to do more studies on such issues okay there is a question from wasim uh, uh, i can read for you uh, dr namneet sharma Uh, address to you poverty socio economic and religious causes can be seen as universal impediments in education is there any unique cause which affects the education of muslim girls in india to dr navid sharma sir as you have written dozens of articles on gender religion and marginality i think satinder ma'am has spoken well about it and yes. Yes. or what is more specific about the indian case and what i have learned from what satinder ma'am and mahima's work is that indian subcontinent let's not call it india only and when we see the case of indian subcontinent where we include 
the idea of Akhand Bharat or Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. In Indian subcontinent, there are multiple issues which are unique to the subcontinent. For example, the idea of caste. For example, the idea of caste and the intersectionality which Anamika was talking about religion, gender, patriarchy. So there are multiple forces within that uh, scenario which, which work there. So it is not that you can pinpoint at one place that it is the traditional sex role. It is the traditional Islamic understanding of how to respond to a Muslim girl child or it is not about the poverty alone. All these factors together. And as what Professor Satvinder suggested, that we need to look at a more holistic manner. That we need to look at that Muslim girl child in more holistic manner, rather than looking into bits and pieces, which, which we have been doing in many policy frameworks, where we look at uh, bits and pieces. But yes, we need to think about it and we need to deliberate more about it, because the recent policy documents have have given sweeping statements, clubbing them all together. Women, Dalits, urban poor, transgenders, Muslim minorities, all together as SDEG, socioeconomically backward groups, something like that, disadvantaged group. But there is need to look into the issues of that why Muslim girl child is getting pushed out in comparison to other people who are marginalized. So we need to undertake more critical studies like Maler Kotla. We need to undertake more critical studies like place which Professor Satinda Pal was suggesting, um, like Mujaffar Nagar. And what Zabal Saab was saying that Southern India tells altogether a different story. So uh, how Southern India responds to the issue of Muslim girl, how Uttar Pradesh responds to it, and how places like Maler Kotla respond to it. We need to have more comprehensive understanding and that's what uh, uh, the diverse uh, yes. and divergent ideas of these issues need to uh, be. Taken. So a couple of more comments are there. So I am going to read for you guys. Uh, historically, there has been a notable rise in girls' education, in girls' school enrollment. However, the increase in higher education enrollment is occurring at a considerably slower pace. Furthermore, those who are enrolled in higher education are not consistently attending. This prompts the question about the underlying differences, the root causes contributing to this phenomena and an exploration of which caste or class of Muslim women are availing themselves of these educational opportunities and why. Probably, I mean, it was answered partially, but maybe there is something left if you want to you want to, should I repeat the last sentence? This prompts question about the underlying differences, the root causes contributing to this phenomena and the exploration of which caste, of which caste or class of Muslim women are availing themselves of these educational opportunities and why. Who gets excluded and why, which, which subsection of the Muslims still remain in the enrollment and you know it depends i think probably itself i mean it's very obvious the social condition or the educational background of the family is where the women are or girls are more protected i think for higher education i mean you guys you can respond to can i can i answer that question sir yeah Udranshu, yes of course Right. The, the answer to that question, sir, would be that uh, the basic problem that Muslims and particularly Muslim girls face while they have any plans for education is that many of them are first generation learners. I have been a professor at one of the universities in Merit and majority of the students were from the peasantry and were Muslims. So the thing was that their communication skills were very poor. They did not know even how to answer basic questions. There was one of my students called Nadim. So I asked him a very basic question that why did you take admission in law? Why did you take admission in this particular university? So his answer was very rustic and insolent as well. 
he mistreated me being a differently abled person he said to me padhne ke liye maine koi ye kya jawab hua padhne ke liye padhne ke liye aapko yahi university mili to education comes with a lot of nuances so the first generation learner has some very peculiar problems and second thing which did not figure in our discussion throughout these last two hours good schools convent schools whether we like it or not but in india the best schools are the convent schools and those convent schools do not admit first generation learners that is the biggest drawback they conduct interviews on the parents and uneducated parents miss the chance and by chance if somebody some uh, there was one muslim boy with me when i was in class 5 his name was adil and he was a motor mechanic son somehow he got into our convent school which i attended was considered the best school in merit so adil was not able to pass class 5 for the next 3 years and he dropped out okay okay let me go ahead with other some comments very important comments we have only 5 or 6 minutes left okay so bear with us it's quite uh, tiring for you guys in india uh, professor arvinder ansari uh, has written yes. professor zoya hasan and ritu menon study of unequal citizen discussion discusses the intersectionality of religion gender class and caste study is majority majority located in up and as a, an extension uh, uh dr javed hussain is writing yes professor ansari unequal citizens by ritu and zoya are kind of classic study it would be very good to reflect on the finding of this study and that of professor kaur and dr maim uh, and maima there there could be interesting comparison points okay so if you want to say anything or just pass this fine um i'll i'll just make a very short and quick observation sure. that we as an academics don't need to give knee jerk responses to certain observation of certain students in a certain classroom scenario be oh. it from first generation learner or second generation learner of course uh, the idea which professor satinder ma'am and mahima have worked upon it it goes quite well along with what unequal citizens points out and and there are other works similar works which need to be read along with these issues and uh, look it's a very complex web when it comes to talking about a muslim girl and her education there is an issue of economic mobility there is an issue of religious constraint there is an issue of patriarchy there is an issue of access to the school and along with that there are issues of hijab there is issue of mosque there is issue of intolerance there are multiple issues which converge upon and there is lot of pressure on a muslim girl child along with the school bag when she walks into the school so we need to be more empathetic and more considerate about the responses that we are getting so, in the class so that is a very distinct phenomena that i mean if we compare with the non muslim girls in the same school setting or in the same town setting this these are many disadvantages or restraints upon the muslim girls right and that is really you know impacting on their uh, progress Uh, so well the one take uh, take out message is social harmony which gives the um, maler kotla a very high marks and Sir, but allow I'll... me to speak allow me to speak i'm hearing for last one and a half hour if you allow me to speak uh who are you i mean you were i am ambut sir i am a student of philosophy and good friends with my friend navneet and uh... sure, sure you have you have not raised the hand so i didn't know sir i'm i'm quite poor in this technology handling oh okay so, so all right so i believe in you know <laughs> listening one to one but i think you are giving this opportunity sure sure and, uh, 
I couldn't resist, and actually, <coughs> Professor Satpinder Pal's address invoked me to just have this kind of reflection on one of the areas which I found, uh, you know, while engaging education, uh, in my own reading is missing. And since Navneet writes on very, uh, you know, diverse kind of uh, areas, engaging education, uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, Navneet, uh, how do you see this uh, influence of cinema on education, primarily uh, women, girl women, uh, this uh, Muslim girl education? Uh, if we see uh, the beginning of the Indian cinema, we find that the the stereotyping about Muslim women was broken. You you know you know you can count the names, Suraya. You can count. You can count the earlier actors, Meena Kumari. You can count Madhubala. You can count Nargis. You can count popular Wahida Rahman. So the the stereotyping of you know the Muslim women, and and the the times when these women entered the cinema was even more, you know, there were more stereotyping for every women, especially, you know, their role in uh, it, it, as an actor. So uh, how do you see that still, you know, despite you have such, uh, you know, visible faces, visible Muslim faces, and still that there is one type of a stereotyping which surely goes and uh, do you think that cinema and education is there some kind of disconnect or some kind of is 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 it not have been able to break that kind of a stereotyping about Muslim right. women primarily? Thank so you. This is the last question, and please be brief, and then we can be off. You know, this is more than two hours, so please go ahead. I'll just quickly add to the response what Tambuj was asking. In fact, what Tambuj has asked can be the topic of one of, another presentation itself. Good. That how, <laughs> how, <laughs> Muslim, <laughs> how, how Muslim women have been presented in Indian cinema and okay. why it could not break the stereotypes. But yeah. look, at, I'm just giving an offhand response to the idea that look at the names that Meena Kumari and Madhubala were compelled to change their names. And it also created another kind of stereotypes that Muslim women use Missy. That is a kind of paste that they used along with their teeth. And they have more smoky eyes. So even when, when Muslim women uh, walked into the cinema, uh, they created a different kind of stereotype while breaking certain stereotypes. And it was said that Shia women and are more beautiful and these women are more beautiful because they are in Farda. That's why they are getting into the cinema. So it created another kind of stereotype. So probably we need another session that why this could not change the scenario. At the it is, it is the Indian society which looks at people who are not similar as a very ah. Uh, this that's, is that's the issue of othering of the Indian subcontinent, actually. If you are not from the same community and you face other, you always look, even in the education, educated society, it irrespect. Actually, villager are, villages are more common. They are less stereotype or they are less biased. And at the moment you become more in urbanized setup, there is always more towards all that, which you will think that we will think otherwise, but it is not so. So we are tuned to all that. It's not only Muslim. Even Muslims look at the non-Muslim in different ways. I mean, that is true. Even within the same community, people look at different cultures in a very different way. Rizvi, uh, Gee, I just want to say that my hometown, Udaipur, is also the place where girls, Hindu and Muslim, both are very educated mm. and we are still living in harmony. There is no wedding without any Hindu wedding, without any Muslim participation or vice versa in Muslim and, and Diwali and uh, um, E. They are all you know, celebrated together. So I just want to say that there is one more city. And of course, as you all know, that now these days, because of all those politics, there are some people who are making the trouble there, but still 
the com both communities are very harmoniously together. And yes, uh, whatever the uh, Professor Kaur said, there is a problem because the girls are more educated. So the uh, marriage is a, is a little bit problem. But otherwise, so I hope that uh, more uh, cities can be like this. A lot of problem with the educated girls. If they are not educated, that is problem. If they're not exactly. educated, that is a problem. Oh, no, no, so no, girls, Maima, what you say about why girls are problem? Why people always consider men? Why men? You you are in America here, yeah, right? So you can very openly say things. So please express yourself what is this issue gender issue i mean i guess you said it yourself i think that the issue is is it's typically men that are posing the problems people might say that it's too difficult if women are overeducated or undereducated but who is saying it is typically men saying it and i think that's really where the issue comes from if you really want to have engaging discussion and set policies towards women education in india and the world as a whole I really believe women should be the ones that are leading those discussions and then finding what the actual problems are. Believe me, I have two daughters, all born and raised here. Both are activists in uh, feminist, and they are hitting on my head all the time that in spite of my all reform postures and all those, they say that you still are, you can still <laughs> your Indianness really. You know, Sir, your, your your question was very interesting. They are less educated, then it is a problem. They are more educated, then it is a problem. Education is not a problem. The problem is that that educated girl should be ready to marry an illiterate man and to serve the whims and fancies so of that, that illiterate happen. man. That doesn't happen. With, with obedience. That is the problem. So that that does not happen. happen. That doesn't happen. Not to a very educated girl, she will remain un unmarried rather than going to a high schooler. I mean, very rare. Unless that high schooler is a millionaire, that's a different choice. So, yeah. <laughs> he is very silently expressing <laughs> we are on equal path considerably. And he, still, she, she complains that, you know, we are not equal in spite of all equality. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I'm coughing a lot, so I will not speak more. It was a very engaging session, very informative, very inspiring also, and very at the same time very depressing also, no doubt about it. And we thank you, sir. Yeah, we wish that you this team can appear again for more extended lecture on the theme because such uh, such kind of topics are needed really to educate ourselves or to extract out from these projects how to use these models and recreate somewhere else certain situation. Uh, I mean, after all, this is one objective of such kind of uh, gathering that whether we just intellectually engage or we go beyond to make some difference. So thank you all and hope to see you again and it has been more than two hours quite late in good night time. uncle yeah good night and good night good night everyone or good good okay good. With that. yeah